Anao developed a paralysis of a right arm that had no cause, what is now called, was then called, a hysterical paralysis of her right arm. When Gray examined it, saw there was absolutely nothing wrong with her. But Shako had suggested, and Roy had took some lessons from Shako, that hypnosis is useful in treating hysteria. So he hypnotized her, but more importantly, he saw that doing the hypnosis, she would speak to him and he would speak to her. There was a free association. There was a beginning of a psychoanalysis. And she described to him that her father often liked to lie on this arm. And he died in this position as he became ill. And when he was in this position, an arm, she had positive feelings about him and negative position feelings, and she became very guilty about the negative feelings. And this haunted her. And as she talked about it with Maria, the hysteria lifted and she became well. Freud was ecstatic about this. This is exactly what he wanted to do. He traveled to Paris, he worked with Charcot, he came back, adopted only sort of the psychotherapeutic interaction, dropped the hypnosis. In 1895, he wrote an essay, Psychoanalysis for the Neurologist. Has anyone in the audience read it? Raise your hand, please. Does anybody in the audience understand me? Yes. Good. Uh, don't read it if you haven't read it, it's essentially incomprehensible. He tried to develop a neural model of the mind based upon psychoanalysis. And we knew so little about the brain, and we knew so little about psychoanalysis, to put the two together was impossible. He realized this is much too early. Someday, he said, some intelligent, young Italian scientist is gonna put the whole thing together, but this is too early. And when this comes along, many of my ideas would be falsified. So he developed a cognitive psychology. The observable behavior based on the patient's symptoms and normal behavior. He developed a theoretical way of interpreting this, psychoanalysis and cognitive psychology, mental representation of conscious and unconscious processes. And he realized that underlying all of this are brain processes that someday will explain what these conscious and unconscious processes are about. So to try to explain Freud's scientific psychology and three key ideas is a little bit silly, but that has not stopped me in the past, so I will do it now. One, he said human beings are not rational creatures. They're driven by irrational, unconscious mental processes. Other people had said this before. This was not Freud's most original idea. But this is more original. Adult character, including unconscious sexuality and aggression, can be traced to the mind of a child. Three, no mental event occurs by chance. There is no noise in the machine. Mental events adhere to scientific laws and follow the principles of psychic determinism. As a result of his contribution, Freud has emerged as a major source of a Rokotansian inclination to look for key meaning beneath the surface of behavior. He was, in fact, very much influenced by Rokotansky. And when Rokotansky died, the first of all, I should say, anyone who did research at the University of Vienna Hospital had to give the talk in front of Rokotansky. And Rokotansky had to give an approval of the lecture. Freud gave two of his lectures in front of Rokotansky. Rokotansky liked it a great deal. When Rokotansky died, Freud went to his funeral, wrote to his friend, the great hero of Vienna medicine is dying. And when Freud died, in his obituary, a number of people pointed out, you know it was very fortunate he trained with Rokotansky because psychoanalysis is quite speculative. Imagine where he'd gone if he hadn't trained with Rokotansky. But despite the fact that Freud had many insights, there's one thing he didn't. No, and that's in large part because he didn't spend much time in Italy. I don't think he ever came here, and he never visited Bologna. But he knew absolutely nothing about women. His insight was extremely limited. He thought women, obviously had never met an Italian woman, didn't enjoy sexuality. They had sex only because they felt obligated, they wanted to have children, and they particularly wanted boy children because boys have a penis, and they did not have. Klimt, 
who took a number of Italian journeys and knew several thousand women intimately, knew a great deal about female sexuality. And he was influenced by Rodin. Rodin told his models, don't pose for me. Just assume any posture around my studio and I'm, I'm interested, I'll draw you. So the models would lie around. After a while, they would masturbate. They might love, make love to a man who was coming through. They might make love to a woman who was there. But anyway, they began to enjoy themselves sexually while Clip was sort of walking around. And Clint portrayed them in various postures, not in a pornographic, but an extremely delicate form. You see, this is an insight into the fact that women can enjoy their sexuality. And he does it in a way that in no way elicits a pornographic sensation. It's a very honest, elegant depiction. To appreciate how important this was, let me show you how different Klimt was to the conventional depiction of the nude in Western art. If you look at Giorgione, and these are Italians, Titian, Spaniards, Goya, French, Manet, they all depict the nude in a similar way. First of all, they're all mythological women. Venus, Venus, Maya, Olympia. This is not the girl next door, number one. Number two, they're all looking out at the viewer, at the beholder as if their only interest was to satisfy the sexual curiosity of the beholder, usually a male. And finally, if you look very carefully, you'll see that in three cases of the four, one, two, three, their left hand is over their pubic area. But you don't know, is this modesty? Or are they pleasuring themselves? Are they masturbating? With Klimt, there's never a moment's hesitation. You know immediately. Klimt not only knew that women had as great an erotic urge as men, but he had the remarkable insight to realize that women like men could fuse eroticism and aggression. This is Klimt's greatest painting, Judith and Holofernes. Many of you probably know the story. Um, Holofernes was a, a Syrian general. I'm fine. Uh, an Assyrian general who uh, made a siege, whoops, uh, made a siege around a small town near Jerusalem called Bethlehem in 500 BC. After several weeks, the siege became impossible. Uh, there was no sanitary conditions, there was no food, the people were in horrible shape. So Judith, a modest widow, decided she would do something to save the people. She took her handmaiden and she snuck out between the troops forming the siege and she found Holofernes. He was attending a party, enjoying himself a great deal, and she encouraged him to drink more, and he did. She then encouraged him to take her to his tent, which he did. She then encouraged him to make love to her, which was not very difficult to do, and they had sex together. And now he fell asleep, exhausted from sex and drink. She took the sword off the wall and she cut off his head. This is repeatedly depicted in Western art. This woman sacrificing herself for her people. This is not the way Clint depicts Judith and Holofernes. Her breast is exposed, she's in a post-coital trance, still enjoying the sexuality of it all. And in the corner, you can see she's fondling his isolated head, as if it's a love object. This is an extraordinary fusion of aggression with eroticism, which I later will explain to you in biological terms. But no one had ever painted a painting like this before. But how did Rokotansky who influenced Freud, also influenced Clint. Well, he did it through Emil Zuckerkantl, the great anatomist who was his associate. Emil Zuckerkantl was the husband of Bertha Zuckerkantl. Bertha Zuckerkantl ran a great salon in Vienna. This is where all the intellectuals came, the artists, the scientists, 
if it's a business people, writers, physicians. She said, on my diva, my sofa, Vienna comes alive. Klimt came, other people came, and Klimt became fascinated with Chukka He became interested in biology. He went out and he read Darwin. When he died, there were four volumes of Darwin in his collection. Would you raise your hand, how many people in the audience have four volumes of Darwin? Not even Pierre George has four volumes of Darwin. This is pretty sad. <laughs> this is remarkable. And he began to look in the microscope. He went to Tsukha Khan's lecture, and he became interested in cells. And the cells he became fascinated with, not surprising, were sperm and eggs. And he began to incorporate his symbols of sperm and eggs into his paintings. Now, many of you have seen this, but probably did not appreciate it. So let me point this out to you. This is Zeus coming to Diana in a shower of raindrops. You see these golden raindrops here, but if you look very carefully, you see this rectangular symbol. That rectangular symbol is sperm for Clement. These oval circles here are ova. So he depicts Diana as a reproductive machine converting sperm to embryos. If you look at many of his paintings, this is the famous painting, The Kiss. You see the mane's coat is covered with these rectangular symbols. The female coat is covered with these circular symbols. Sperm, eggs. Oops. A wonderful thing about Klimt is not only was he a great artist, but he was a great supporter of younger artists, of Kokoschka and of Schiele, even though they broke dramatically with them. Klimt really was sort of an Art Nouveau artist. He spent some time in Ravana, and he loved the gold that he saw there in the mosaics, and he adopted that in many of his paintings. So you see a very rich background in Klimt's paintings. This is not the way Kokoschka and Schiele operated. They became expressionists. Kokoschka is the first Viennese expressionist. Influenced by Munch, he began to introduce a very different style of art. And he had major themes. One is an emphasis on hands and face as a conveyor of emotion, a fascination with child and adolescent sexuality, and a major interest of going below the surface to explore his own emotional life and that of his subjects. He said he discovered the unconscious independent of Freud. I don't for a moment believe this, but this is what he said. And just like Freud spent a certain amount of time at the end of each day analyzing himself, so Kokoschka spent a certain amount of time analyzing himself. Let me just remind you, Klimt, and this is Klimt, look at the background, this typical rich art nouveau artificial background, and he of course are the sperm and the eggs, you know all of this. This is not what Kokoschka did. Look at his background. His background is colors that don't at all relate to reality. They're, they're designed to depict the emotion. This was just after Kokoschka had broken up with Alma Mahler. Alma Mahler was Gustav Mahler's widow. She had a very important affair in Kokoschka during which period he really emerged from being a student to being a great artist. So not only did he have a powerful love experience with her, but his life was altered by her presence. And you can see he was not only nervous during his whole relationship with her, but he continued to be nervous for many years afterwards. In fact, he made up an artificial doll that looked like Alma Mala and carried this life-size doll with him for several years. If you look at the self-portrait, you see that he's extremely insecure. He holds his fingers up to his mouth. And if you look at the colors, they no bear no relationship to reality. He uses color not to convey naturalness, but to convey emotion. Look at the redness that he has in the fingertips, around the ears, etc. And he uses body gestures and hands to communicate his inner feelings. He not only studied himself, but he studied others, and he had the feeling that if he painted you, and he spent five or 10 days studying you as he painted you, he could predict the rest of your life. He understood your whole psychology. 
And I just give you one example. This is August Varela, a very famous European psychiatrist. He was director of Bricolzi, he was a professor at the University of Zurich. And this is a period in which Kokoschka was being supported by the great architect Adolf Flores. And Adolf Flores would go around to people like Pier Giorgio, and he said, look, Pier Giorgio, you have a great career, you're a great scientist, you should let Kokoschka paint your portrait. And if you don't like it, I will take it back. He said this to Pharrell. Pharrell's relatives agreed. So he came for 10 evenings after dinner. He painted Pharrell's picture. Uh, and when he was finished, Pharrell looked at it, and the family looked at it. They said, we don't like it. They rejected it. He said, you know, it doesn't look natural. He looks like he had a stroke. Look, his eyes are asymmetrical. And look at his right hand. It's droopy. You know, it just doesn't look right. The fact is, Laws took the painting back, sold it to a museum, and two months later, Pharrell had this identical stroke. Now, it's known among the neurologists in the audience that prior to a stroke, people can have ischemic episodes that simulates what's going to happen later on. And he did this repeatedly. Moreover, he was the first one to depict adolescent nudes. This is girl Lee. I don't know if any of you have read the Tom and the Knabe, a fairy tale that he decorated with images on the side, colored images. Lee was the woman in this unconsummated relationship he describes there, and he paints her in her awkwardness in the nude. They never consummated their relationship. He also realized that not only is there adolescent female sexuality, but there's infantile female sexuality. The Steins had their children's picture painted, and here is Walter and here's Lotta lying on the floor, and he is trying to pull her close to him, very much attracted by his sister, and she is clenched to right fist, feeling closeness is fine, but too close, and I'll punch you in the nose. This painting made an enormous impression on the great art historian Gombrich. And if I can find it, I'll read to you what Gombrich says about this. Gombrich writes, in the past, the child in the painting had to look pretty and contented. Grown-ups did not want to know about the sorrows and agonies of childhood, and they resented it if aspects of it were brought home to them. But Kokoschka would not fall in with these demands of convention. We feel that he looked at these children with deep sympathy and compassion. He has caught their wistfulness and their dreaminess, the awkwardness of their movements and the disharmonies of their growing bodies. His work is all the more true to life for what it lacks in conventional accuracy. The last of the three artists is Egon Schiele, who in some ways is the most radical. He did not simply use face and hands, but he used the total self, the whole body, as an object of exploring the existential anxiety of modern life. Let me remind you, these people lived just at the beginning and early phase of the First World War. And what Schiele did was to really represent existential anxiety at its extreme, and he felt that the best way he could do this is in the nude. And many of his paintings were in the nude. Even in making love, he and his love object look like they're in the verge of a nervous breakdown, hardly enjoying the love of their sexual experience. He posed repeatedly in the nude, and in a one-year period, 1910 to 1911, Sheely painted 100 self-portraits. Now let me remind you, Klimt never painted a self-portrait. Kokoschka did a couple. Klimt did 100 in a one-year period. Those, that's more self-portraits than people like Rembrandt or Beckman who painted self-portraits throughout their whole life to depict, as we heard earlier, the stages of life. In one year, 100 self-portraits in different positions. Moreover, since Klimt depicted masturbating women, he thought, why not depict masturbating men? If he was going to depict anybody, why not depict himself masturbating? Now, I need hardly tell you that no one has done this either before or afterwards, depicting themselves masturbating. But he did not want to be outdone by Clement. 
So let me go to the second phase, psychology and art. The beholder share. This is really quite fascinating. Alois Regal was a great art historian, head of the Vienna Art History School, who was at the uh, Kunsthistorische Museum from about 1880 to 1906 when he died. And he felt that art history, art scholarship, is going to die unless it becomes more scientific. The science in order to direct itself to is psychology, and the problem it ought to address is how does the viewer respond to a work of art? The painter paints a painting, but the painting is not complete unless the viewer responds to the painting. This is the most obvious thing in the world, we all know that, but no one had quite put it in a task that we want to understand what is happening in the mind of the beholder when he responds to a work of art. What in an art is enjoyable for the viewer, what is not enjoyable? What is erotically enticing, what is not? So he encouraged a scientific approach through psychology to the beholder shield. That should be the paradigm we should first look at. Two of his latest disciples, Ernst Chris, who later became an analyst, but first was a great art historian, and Ernst Garbage took this up. Ernst Chris said, Art is ambiguous. You and I look at the same painting. We see it slightly differently. What does that mean? That each of us are undergoing a slightly different creative experience. We're reproducing in our mind the painting in a slightly different way. We don't see it precisely the same way. We see it differently. So each of us giving it a little creative spin, if we will. That means the beholder is undergoing, in a modest way, a creative experience that parallels the creative experience of the artist. Garmitch went wild with this idea. He thought this was a fantastic idea. And he began to study the psychophysics of visual perception. How do we see the outside world? How do we see objects? How do we see people? And he realized one needed to develop a cognitive psychology for visual perception. He read Bishop Berkeley, and Bishop Berkeley pointed out to him the surprising fact that when I look at the face of my wife Denise, the beautiful face of my wife Denise, we're celebrating our 60th wedding anniversary in a month. I could well believe that you think I have been married for 60 years. She does not look like she's married for 60 years. Anyway, when I look at her face, the only thing that my retinas see is the photons bouncing off her face. This is clearly inadequate for me to reconstruct the knees the way I see her. But Pier Giorgio and I see her pretty much the same way. Anybody else looking at her see her pretty much the same way. You see even the dress that she bought in Torino today. Very clearly, and all I see of that dress is not how much it costs, but the photons bouncing off the dress. So clearly, I see the knees, and you see the knees in pretty much the same way. So there must be additional source of information. Helmholtz pointed out that in addition to photons bouncing off her face and her body, there are other, two other sources of information, bottom up and top down. Bottom up information is, that the human brain has evolved over millions of years, at least six million years. So we have built in mechanisms for perception. We realize that when we see a source of light, we think it's above because the sun comes from above. If I see you larger than a person, I think that you are probably closer to me than that person. So there are many rules that have really sort of built into the brain as a result of evolutionary changes, Darwinian changes that have occurred in the history of humankind. This is bottom-up perception. But there's also top-down. We live, live, uh, live in different experience, you know, live in different places. Some of us live in, uh, in Bologna, others live in Milan, others live in Turin. We can't all live in Bologna, it's a small town, it can only handle about 200,000 people. If we were to all move in, which would be very attractive, we would have a disaster. So anyway, this is a great limitation. 
So, it, it, as a result, there really is an enormous need to expand on this. Now, if there is, and, and these experiences that we have, the art that we see, the people interact with, these are influence our response to a work of art. So if I've seen a lot of work of art, uh, I will respond differently to a work of art that I see a new work than somebody who's never looked at a piece of work of art before. So in addition to bottom-up processes, there are top-down processes. Now if the bottom-up processes are determined by the way our brain works, our brain is uh, built, then you know, to some degree, we're taking guesses. We're assuming an average expectable environment. So it should be possible to trick the brain in ways. Let me show you one example. This is the Kazanika square. This is a black square on top of four white circles. Do you all see this black square? Please raise your hand. Do you all see a black square? Raise your hand. Wonderful. You are making it up. It's not there. It's completely in your head. If I spin these around, you see that that black square disappears. You are filling in this black. What is there were four open circles, and they're arranged in such a way that it allows you to fill in with your imagination something which is not there anymore. This is just a simple example of how bottom-up processes work. 99% of the time, they're right, but because you're guessing, a smaller percentage of time, they're gonna be wrong. So Chris and Gottmich elaborated a similar three-step analysis to Freud. There's the beholder's behavior, the beholder's share, the cognitive psychology, the mental representation of perception, emotion, empathy. And someday, they said, brain mechanisms will come along to describe the nature of perception, emotion, and empathy. In fact, at the end of his career, Gottmich began to work on this. In my last part, I want to describe to you the beginning we have of a biological understanding of the beholder ship. So I outline for you in very simple terms how the beholder responds to a work of art and how that's represented in the brain. I'll look at another person's face. There's an analysis in the brain of the facial contours, a representation of details of the face, a representation of the body, both stationary and in motion. There's a simulation of action, and there's a simulation of the mind. So when I look at Pier Giorgio, I know that he has a different mind than I have. He thinks about things differently than I do on many things. People who can't make that distinction suffer from autism. And you can tell when they look at work of art that these people have a difficult time separating themselves from a work of art. And this psychological insight into another person is extremely important, needless to say. Let me begin with an analysis of facial contour. There are two aspects to this analysis, a psychological one and a biological one. Let me begin with the psychological one. Darwin first pointed out that faces are so extremely important to human beings because it's the key for social interactions. We look at each other, we see whether somebody is enjoying our company or not. We see in business interactions whether the person is trustworthy or not. A lot of this is determined by facial expressions. We meet our partners, we decide whether or not we're gonna engage in a relationship, in part because of our facial interactions. Obviously, many more things are involved. Faces are treated differently by the brain than any other object. If I take this glass of water and turn it upside down, I would spill the water, but if I were to turn this glass cup of water upside down, I would spill the water, but you would still recognize the cup upside down. But as I will show you, faces are difficult to recognize upside down. Computers have enormous difficulty with recognizing faces, yet we are extremely good at it. Young kids can recognize hundreds of faces. You put a young kid into a monkey colony, they can recognize 100 different faces. 
put you into monkey colony. In our age, you have a difficult time to recognize three different monkeys. And we are particularly good with recognizing people on drawings because drawings often exaggerate. And we're terrific with cartoons. One of the reasons cartoons are so effective is because an exaggerated depiction of you, sir, is more recognizable than a photograph of you. Because a good cartoonist will exaggerate those characteristics that define your character. Let me just give you an example. I show you two upside down images. Since you're Italian, you will realize this is Leonardo in the Louvre. This is the Mona Lisa. So many of you may recognize that this is Mona Lisa, even though she's upside down. But what you don't realize is that the facial expressions are dramatically different. This is the enigmatic Mona Lisa. This is a distortion. So with images, even if you know them upside down, you cannot see the distortion. What about the biology of the facial representation? Is there a specific area in the brain that faces are represented, and how are they represented? Well, we first learned about facial representation in 1947, when a neurologist in Germany, Joachim Parma, encountered three people who had face blindness. This he called prosap agnosia. Agnosia means blindness, for and prosap means face. When they died, he examined them, and he found out that all of them had lesions in the inferior temporal cortex. Now, most of you probably know there are four cortical regions, frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal. Visual information comes into the occipital lobe, and some of it spreads out into the inferior part of the temporal lobe. So this is where information comes in, and the inferior and anterior temporal cortex is where facial representation occurs. If you have a lesion here, you don't recognize the face qua face. Oliver Sacks is a famous case. A man who mistook his wife for a hat. A woman takes her husband to a physician to examine him. When the examination is over, they're ready to leave. He tries to pick up his wife's head and put it on his head, thinking it's his hat. If the lesion is in the anterior inferior temporal lobe, you recognize the face qua face, but you have difficulty recognizing who it is. Ten percent of this audience has this kind of facial diagnosis. It's extremely common. Ten percent of people are born with it. So you recognize a face qua face, but you have difficulty recognizing which specific person it is. Recently, there's been major advance in analyzing this region of the brain, the inferior temporal cortex. First, Charlie Gross began to record from different regions here with microelectrodes and monkeys, and he realized that some cells here respond to hands and some respond to faces. But Marge Livingston, Doris Chow, and Winfred Rifle, just in the last three years, carried this a major step forward. They worked primarily with monkeys, and they did fMRI imaging on monkeys while they showed monkeys' faces. And they saw that six patches lit up. One, two, three, four, five, six. They call these face patches because they lit up when you showed them faces. They then put the fMRI machine away and they put electrodes into these areas and they found that 95% of the cells respond to faces. Moreover, when they stimulated the central patches, they lit up the other patches, indicating this is a system for face processing. Some of the posterior patches recognize faces, but only from one perspective. The more anterior face patches put all this together and they recognize faces from any perspective. So let me just give you one example. If you show a monkey a picture of a monkey, they love it. The cell goes Burr. If you show a monkey a cartoon of a monkey, it likes it even more, it goes Burr. Now the interesting thing about the cartoon is it needs to have everything, but it doesn't need to have a nose. 
We think, although we don't know, that maybe the reason the nose is not important is the nose does not participate importantly in changes in facial expression. But anything else, you take out the mouth, no response. You take out the eyes, no response. Eyes, mouth, and no circle, no response. Circle, nothing else, no response. You need all of them. If you empty out, no response. If you turn it upside down, no response. If you exaggerate like a cartoon, eyes apart, close together, cells go wild. So I won't take you through all the areas. Let me just briefly outline for you what other things are represented in the brain. There's a representation of the body, there's a representation of the body in motion, there's a simulation of action. Risolati, actually an Italian who made this major discovery, a mental simulation. So let me give you some examples. So information comes in, visual information at the back of the brain, and it's fed on here for face processing. There is also a very important role here in the lateral occipital cortex where visual and tactile information interact. This is very important for life, but it's also important for painting. Many paintings, like Soutine, de Kooning, have very rich paint, they layer it on. And Berenson first pointed out, so you see this in, in Renaissance painting as well, that there's a tactile sensation that you can sense in your body when you look at those paintings. There is then an extra striped body area, which responds to the body. There's an area that responds to motion. And there's a response, there's an area that responds to biological motion. So this area that responds to motion responds to a car, responds to a bicycle. Biological motion responds to human motions. Just reaching your hand or walking towards somebody. People with autism who have difficulty with social interactions do not light up this area. They do not become active with biological motion. There are two areas discovered here in Italy that are concerned with the simulation of action. Now, if there's a monkey looking at, jo at uh, Pier Giorgio here, when we record from Pier Giorgio's brain, and he picks up a glass of water, this area fires. That's not surprising. That's why he has a motor system. But what is surprising is that the monkey also, those cells fire when P. Giorgio picks up a glance of water. So those cells respond as a mirror to what you are doing. And we now think that a lot of infantile learning, child learning, goes on by not only listening to the words that the mother and the father speak to them, but also looking to the facial expressions that is being copied and simulated. In addition to this simulation, there's also an area that is concerned with theory of mind and realization that your aspirations and your goals are different from mine. And again, kids with autism have difficulty with this. And finally, there are areas in the brain that are involved with emotional reactions to work of art. And I just want to give you one example of this. There's the hypothalamus and the amygdala. The amygdala is the orchestrator of emotion. It sends signals for emotion to various regions. And the hypothalamus is the executor of emotion. And finally, there's the dopaminergic system which modulates emotion. I'm going to say a word about all of these. And I want to use this example, Klimt's famous painting of Judith and Holofernes. He showed that women like men confuse eroticism with aggression. But this raises the larger question. Eroticism is here. Aggression is here. You would think they would be very far apart. They're almost polar opposites. Love and hate. How come it's so easy to fuse them? What is it about the brain that allows this fusion? In the last year, David Anderson has explained to us, in the hypothalamus, the cells that mediate aggression and the cells that mediate eroticism are right next to each other. And in between, there's a 20% cell, 20% of cells that is shared by both aggression and eroticism. Fighting neurons and mating neurons are right next to each other. In between, either fighting or mating. If you stimulate weakly, I jokingly call this foreplay, 
you get mating behavior, erotic behavior. If you say strongly, you get fighting behavior. So you can see how people can get confused because of the intimacy and also on the signals playing. Let me end by saying, can brain science teach us something about the love of art? Now you probably know that this painting by Klecht, Adele Bloch-Bauer, has bought by Ronald Lauder about 10 years ago for $130 million, the most ever paid for a work of art up to that time. Why did he pay so much money? Let me tell you that. Ronald Lauder comes from a very wealthy family. When he was very young, he already started to make his annual European trip. He came to Bologna, came to Vienna, and he saw this painting in the Opera Belvedere, and he fell in love with it. He thought this was really the most fantastic painting he'd ever seen. This is a femme fatale. This is the modern Leonardo. He came back and looked at this painting time and time again. He came from a wealthy family. He wanted to buy it, couldn't buy it. So, you probably have had this experience when you really, you know, like something very much. It really activates your brain in the areas that are particularly involved in the orbital frontal cortex and modular toy system of the brain, particularly the dopaminergic system. Now the dopaminergic system acts on almost every aspect of the beholder shape, yeah? and the dopamine system gets recruited for several things. Primary reward like food, drink, and sex, addiction, romantic love, and love of art. Now some of you have probably had this experience of being rejected in a love relationship. But when you fall in love, the dopamine system gets recruited, pours out dopamine, but if you get rejected, it pours out even more dopamine. Same with art. When you love a work of art, dopamine gets recruited. If you're rejected, it pours out even more. Laura, every year, goes to Vienna, gets rejected, becomes ambassador to Austria for the United States, visits that painting almost every day, not a chance, cannot have it sees this all the time, he's going out of his mind. The dopamine system is going wild. He would have paid 135, 140 million. He was glad to get it for 130 million. So let me end. The greatest enterprise for the human mind has been, always been, to link the sciences and the humanities. This is a great tradition in Italy. It's now becoming a worldwide tradition. The Viennese modernists were among the first to establish these linkages between art and science by focusing on the behavior to share. And their pioneering attempts in this great enterprise continues at the Festival de la Science, Medica Bologna, where the spirit of modernism is carried forward to this day. Thank you very much.